Today on The Jeff Wilson Show, a special episode highlights of my conversations with super collector Marshall Fogel, his very best advice for collecting sports memorabilia. Hello, and here we go. Welcome to another episode of The Jeff Wilson Show. If you were to put together a Mount Rushmore of the all-time greatest collectors of sports cards and memorabilia, Marshall Fogel would absolutely be on that Mount Rushmore. I've had the honor of getting to go visit Marshall multiple times and sit down with him and learn a lot about his collection and how he built it. And some of that we have shared on the Sports Card Investor channel over the last couple of years. But there's more, more from my conversations with Marshall that we hadn't yet shared, and we're doing so today. Today's gonna be a special episode where we're focusing in on collecting sports memorabilia, bats especially, for the first part of this episode, but then we're gonna touch on other types of sports memorabilia and sports cards as well. And what we've done is we've compiled from different interviews that I've done with Marshall, a lot of his ideas, a lot of his theories, and a lot of his advice on collecting bats, on collecting sports memorabilia, and on collecting sports cards of all type. Some of these clips you may have seen before, but there's a lot of new things in here as well that you haven't, because we're showing you some footage that nobody has ever seen before, but is definitely worth your time. So let's get started. My conversations with super collector Marshall Fogel. Marshall, thanks so much for having us back out to your secured vault here. We are just outside of Denver, and this is the home of the greatest bat collection there is. It's not at the Hall of Fame. It is here in your secured vault, and I cannot wait to see these bats today. But first, I want to learn more from you about this. So welcome and give us some education on bats. My pleasure, and thanks for inviting me. Um... There is a history of collecting bats. The first question that I'll answer by giving my own question is, why collect baseball bats? Well, if you go to uh, New York Metropolitan Museum or some of the fine museums in the country, what do you see? You'll see Indian arrowheads and Indian arrowheads with shafts on them and spears from the Roman Empire and all kinds of weapons, swords. So picture the bat as a weapon. It's what makes either you a great soldier in part, or you're a great basketball player, or you're a great hockey player with a, you know, a stick or a lacrosse with a, with a weapon to hit, to move the ball. So there's something important about what kind of career you have by the ability to hit. So I consider collecting bats, number one, is extremely important to the game and the pleasure people get in holding Babe Ruth's bat or uh, a favorite player, whether he's in the Hall of Fame or he's not in the Hall of Fame because he held that bat. The, the, the second uh, reason is that it also is great if you're a collector, no matter what your level of financial security is in collecting, is that let's say you collect the bat of a player that you find as a favorite and you have his baseball card and you might have a magazine with his picture on it. And so I think when you collect, including bats, make a story with more than just one item of the player. You, you can have his baseball cap and his photograph. So not only in it standing in and of itself is a great item in your collection, but also it's a great way to tell the story of a player that you happen to have a, a great admiration for. So that's part of the reason I, early on, were collecting bats, because I remember Lou Gehrig game use bats were selling for $15,000 and nobody would buy them. So that meant just like all the other items, baseball cards or photographs, there has to be a start. Fortunately, I was at the beginning 
And think about this, 1989, that's not that far long ago, how new all this is and how it's grown into uh, uh, a, a collectible that has a value, whether it's worth $5,000 or $500,000. It's just room for everybody. And so when we talk about bats, uh, there's room for everybody as well. So how did it come about that I got involved in baseball bats? Well, the first problem was, how do we know it's real? How do we know it's game used? Where did these bats come from? Louisville Slugger, Spalding's, Batright, Kren, Zinn Beck. These are all the old bat label periods. So let's start with Louisville Slugger. Why did these bats survive? Cobb, Hack Wilson, Lou Gehrig, Babe Ruth, Chris Speaker, and the list goes on and on and on. And the fortune story is, and it's a beautiful story, is that Louisville Slugger had a vault. And they also uh, started to uh, use uh, bats to calibrate new bats for the player. And we'll indicate how do we know that. So early on, when I started collecting bats, myself, Dave Bushing, and Dan Knoll wrote the first baseball book. Now you can see how thin it is. In other words, this is all we knew, and it was pretty good. But later on, with my help, Vince Malta wrote the, the, the book that updates what we have learned. So these Bibles, as I call them, are helpful in being able to understand what the spat that we are going to look at one by one today is all about. So how are bats made? First of all, when I was at Louisville Slugger, this is uh, November 8th, 2007, they used to make all the bats hand-turned and they would calibrate uh, the diameter, the length, and the weight. So today, there's only one person that makes handmade bats. The rest of them are made by machine. Well, who gets to have handmade calibrated bats? Cal Ripken, and the list goes on. You know, a player that has uh, a lot of magic in the game can have a hand-turned bat. The re but that doesn't mean they're any better or worse, but it's, it's the gold standard if you make it with Louisville Slugger. It's, that's how I see it. So you can see he, the hand-turned fellow that makes the bats made one for me. My batting average is zero, but he did me a favor. So that's, you can see the, the knobs on the bat, back and on the front of the bat. So it goes into a lathe, and then they have these calibrated uh, metal devices. There might be 20 of them on here. So that they make the bat to the specifications of the player by rotating the, the bat, and then they cut off the end pieces and then they, they paint them with the color that the player desires in the modern era. So the next step is, what did I see when I went to Louisville Slugger on several occasions and got to meet uh, John Hill, Rick, one of the heirs to the Louisville Slugger uh, uh, shop. And so we, at the time, we didn't have bat records. We, they wouldn't let us see them. Well, what kind of bat records did they have? They were on little cards and they were on uh, uh, some kind of film. It, it was totally disorganized because, you know, what did they care? Uh, but they kept records. And then um, uh, there was a wonderful man named Rex Bradley that kind of was in charge of that. And how we could find out if we thought the bat was used, we'd call Rex on the phone. This is all before the internet. And then he'd go look up the card and he would tell us if in his opinion, it, it was a true game used Louisville Slugger bat. But he was the keeper of the records and they held him close to the vest. Well, that's what it was like when we went out there myself, a fellow named Steve Turman, and Dave Bushing. 
and they were going to let us see the vault, and they were going to let us see the brands that branded the bats. <coughs> well, the ba the brands were all over the place. It, it was disorganized, but they knew in their head where certain brands were because they changed the brands over the years. Well, we said, let's see the vault room. The vault room turns out to be a closet. <laughs> Honest to God, it's not a vault. It's just a closet, you know, with shells on it. And the bats are just stacked all over the place. And, you know, I thought, wow, this would be like a bank vault. But it was just a closet, you know, like a janitor's closet. Well, we learned something there. Now the, the question is, how did these bats survive? This is a great story. They had these bats that they used uh, to make new bats for players. And so you could see on some of the bats uh, things like S2, M110, uh, what did all that mean? Vault marks, and we'll talk about that, side written. And so they all meant different things. But the uh, uh, key to it was that the reason they had these bats was because the players sent them in for new bats or they made uh, several bats uh, and they might have kept them so that they would get the calibration that the player wanted. But let's turn to the game used bats. Outside of Louisville Slugger in Louisville, Kentucky, they had all the bats outside on on the wooden platforms, just stacked over the years. When they moved to Indiana, and since that time they moved back to Louisville, they're going to throw them away, burn them, and want them. This is this is way before Marshall Fogel and others got involved. So Rex Bradley, the fellow I mentioned, said, "My partner and I, well, why don't you give us the bats?" We said, "Then take them." So they took all these bats, there must have been 7,000 of them, to Indiana to a barn and kept them there. So as the demand for bats increased, uh, they, Rex decided to sell with his partner the collection of bats. And it turns out that people, a couple people that wanted to buy the bats went to the barn and the bats were just black with soot and really not well kept. They were dirty. But some of the bats that were found, Tris Speaker, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, uh, some of the great players, and they were stacked at the front door of the barn. But those people that were interested in buying it couldn't afford the $400,000 plus to buy the we call them the barn bats from Indiana. Well, it turns out that a fellow did buy the bats, got money from his parents and so on, and bought the collection, thinking, well, when I went to the barn, there were all the great players stacked against the barn door because other people had sorted them out. So he thought he had 7,000 bats of Luke, <laughs> Babe Ruth, Ty Cobb, and so on. Well, it turns out he lived in by the side of Manhattan where the Statue of Liberty is, and I had gone out to visit to see the collection, and it, it turns out that most of the bats were blank, college, minor league, minor major leaguers, and a small amount of big time bats. So that deal was renegotiated, but it was disappointing because it wasn't what he thought it would be because of the bats stacked at the barn door. But so this gives you the the beginning of how these bats survived. It's just luck that Rex Bradley asked for them and they gave it to them. The second wonderful thing is they kept records, Louisville Slugger, because if you can't have records like when they ordered the bat, are they index bats? In other words, I could, as a player, order a Mickey Mantle bat with his name on it, with the specifications of a Mantle bat, but 
another player could have ordered it and used it. So by having the bat records and knowing more about it and being able to determine if it looks like it's game use. So it requires some experience in understanding is it a, if the bat really was used that way. So 125 on the bat becomes important. That number probably came about around 1913. Nobody really knows what 125 means. I thought, well, could it be part of some section of the Adirondack Mountains where these ash bats come from? No. Uh, does Brant Hillwork know? No. But we do know that they seem to appear around 1913. And that becomes important because the next is when was made in USA put on the bat? Well, we figured out 1920 in that period. Uh, when was power ice put on the bat? When were the lightning bolts put on the bat? When, when trademark reg was put on the bat? So what you're looking at is how do you break the Rosetta Stone? Mm -hmm. And so there are a number of factors that determine what is the uh, date period of the bat. Number one, Ty Cobb was easy. It's side written when he sent it in. Now he could have sent it in in a different time period based upon all of the markings on the bat, but it's pretty much close to uh, that time period because he might have used it for two or three years, but it's close enough. The question then becomes, well, it's later on in his career. However, this is really one of the best high cob bats ever because it has the spike marks on it. So what we'll learn as I go along is what you look for, uh, how you determine whether you should buy it. Uh, so I brought a, a plethora of bats. Some really incredible ones. I can't wait to hear about these. And they all have different features. Okay. And, and this is basically all indicate how you decide whether you should buy the bat. So the first item that we look at uh, before we get into it is to finish the story about the barn. So ultimately, it turns out that there was a scarcity of the kind of bats that you are from Hall of Fame players in the early years. Uh, so the way it happened is nobody was buying baseball bats that were game use. So it went from the owner of, the, of all these bats to a fella in Aspen, Colorado, and to me. So I always seem to be lucky enough to be first in line only because Nobody wanted them. So you were one of the first people to actually start collecting bats in the in the world. Well, I don't know. I guess you could say the world, was, uh, being that baseball was pretty much an American game at the time. But uh, it's like all my collectibles. Uh, one of the lessons that you can still learn is be be there before anybody discovers it. Sure. So like me collecting photographs, nobody wanted them. Collecting pinbacks, nobody wanted them. Collecting baseball gloves. And as the market matured, uh, it became to a point where if I was collecting today, uh, you'd have to have really deep pockets. So when people say, oh, I have all this money, well, you got to remember, I'm talking 30 years ago. Right. And, and, even, and even when the start of the internet came about, it still was reasonable. Now, I would say since, I don't know, 2015 to today, the curve of value wasn't a curve anymore. It was a, it went straight in the air. Hockey stick growth, yeah. You know, yes, exactly. That doesn't mean that you can't still collect as a hobbyist because there's so much volume. And that's what makes it great. There's a lot of it. And especially today, the players like Mike Trout, I, you know, he, he, he must have 
like their like Jeter, Derek Jeter. There's tons of their bats out there, whether it's a profit motive or or not, uh, or whether they felt it's nice that people could have their bats, but uh, they're still expensive. I also imagine that the players today probably cycle through a lot more bats. Looking at some of these bats, like the Ty Cobb one right there, that looks like he probably used that for a very long time to the point where he he actually repaired the bat. There's actually nails in there to help bring the bat back together. Exactly. And the interesting part is how many bats did the players have for a season? I'm, I'm guessing they're lucky to have a couple. And what if they were really bad? And that gets us into Spalding Bass, which we'll talk about later. Uh, so what I want to talk about, first of all, is I want to go over this whole thing again with clear and convincing evidence. I don't care whatever you collect in the memorabilia world, as opposed to cars that are graded and everybody can understand what that means. The reason you can grade cars is because the the different standards to look for, corner wear, centering, color, appearance, the back, and it goes on and on, they're pretty standard. But when you get into memorabilia, uh, it, it's more diffused. It's, it's more subjective, whether it's a, a signature, a Babe Ruth, or a baseball bat, or a glove. Uh, it requires some real thought. So how do we decide what to buy? What is this general standard? The United States Supreme Court in 1984 used the word clear and convincing evidence. And this is what the Supreme Court of the United States said. And this is what I use and would recommend others use to be able to buy memorabilia. Clear and convincing evidence means the evidence is highly and substantially more likely to be true than untrue. The trier of the fact, meaning the collector, must have an abiding conviction that the truth of the factual contention is highly probable. So what does that eliminate? When you see LOAs, you got to understand LOAs is not a guarantee or a warranty. It's an opinion. And I would rather have them call it letters of opinion than letters of authenticity. Because you can have an item of memorabilia and have 10 people look at it and you can have 10 different opinions. So uh, it requires the collector to dig deep if he's going to spend or she the money on memorabilia, no matter what it is because eventually the truth will come out. And so what I advise people is when you see LOAs, and let's narrow it down to baseball bats, it can include uniforms as well, or, sig or autographs. Don't, there is what's called the rule of exclusion. The rule of exclusion says if it's not A, B, and C, then it must be D. In other words, it's not if if you have all the negatives, this and this is the only positive, it must be true. That's not a science. And anytime you see that kind of stuff, don't buy it. If it says attributable to in LOAs, don't buy it. If it said possibly, don't buy it. If it says circumstances show, don't buy it. If it says uh uh it could be, or it might be, or any of that kind of compromising language, don't buy it. Well, then what should I buy? It's got to be all there. It's got to be all there. Let's say you spend $50,000 on a bat, and you got a letter from an authenticator that said, or that uses the rule of exclusion, or said that it's attributable to, or it's possible, or the circumstances require us to believe that it's true. You know, if you want to spend 800 bucks, it's okay. But if you're going to buy a, a, a bat and you're spending thousands of dollars, be patient. Don't let your addiction take over the, your reason. So now you know the focus of what you need to do. So we'll move on to the next step. Okay. Let's look at these bats. So some of these authenticators, they'll have player characteristics. 
ball marks, stitch marks, bat rack marks, handle condition, deadwood, check, cleat marks, special handle preparation, nails, pine tar, correct uniform number that's on, a, uh, on the bat that would put the uniform number maybe, uh, grain examination, professional grain, autograph, yes or no, barrel problems, all this, all these attributes. There's so many attributes that I'm much in favor of listing these attributes. There's no right or wrong answer. What I'm not in favor of is grading bats. And there are bat dealers that don't grade bats for the reasons I don't think you should. There are uh, uh, bat authenticators that grade bats. That's their opinion, and I have mine. But I'm the one that pays the money. They're the ones that make the money. And that doesn't mean they're wrong, but it's not the standard that I use on all these ways like possible and clear and convincing. Is the, I use the highest standards because in the long run, I want to make sure that I have something credible. So let's see how to, what the problems are. If you look at the cob bat, it's a mess. This, see, this is called checking where the, wood, where the wood grains are split. And what this is caused by is the velocity of the ball hitting the barrel of the bat. So if you look at a Ted Williams bat, he always believed, in, and this is why he's on the cover of the, of the book that we'll talk about, because Williams would go to the factory and if... And if the barrel has to have tree rings between 11 to 13, he claimed that was the best barrel heading surface to have it tight. So if you look at this bat here, Colfax, look, look, see how the tree rings are far apart? Mm -hmm. That's because they're man grown. The earlier bats are not man grown. They've been there for hundreds of years. And so the grain is tight because each grain is a year of growth. Most of the bats, early bats, come from the Adirondack Mountains because the ash trees are were remarkable to make bats. Okay, so moving on. Here's a Thai cob bat with all of these markings on it. It also has the fact that he sent the bat in in 1925. And the way they would send the bats in is they'd put a piece of paper and tape and put their address on and the, their return address and Louisville Slugger's address. They didn't put them in a box. They just stuck them to the post office and, 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 and did it that way. So now let's look at the Dimaggio bat. That Ty Cobb bat, the different markings on it, are those, are those uh, spike marks at the end? Yes. This, I call it, this is the personality of a bat. So let's look at Colfax's bat. You know, I, honestly, I, I don't know if there's three of them out there. Now, Colfax couldn't hit a soccer ball, okay? So his bat has hardly anything on it. And we know pitchers, for some reason, can't hit anything. Except for Otani now. Right. And Babe Ruth back in the day. Right. That's two out of them, 10,000. You're right. So what we have here is a no question, a, a bad issue to Colfax, signed by Colfax, and it's the hitting surface is pretty clear that it's not like Ty Cobb. So, so would that bat grade higher than Ty Cobb? We'll talk about that. See, in my opinion, I'd much rather have the, the Ty Cobb bat because it looks like it's been beat up, but that is what you almost want to see if it's a bat, right? You want to know that the player was out there using it. Or is that not what you want to see when you're looking to collect? Well, I'll explain that. Let's get to, this will help you. Here's DiMaggio's bat. We're going to talk about when this bat was made. Okay. See how smooth it is? It looks very smooth. See, to me, that doesn't look like that was maybe used as often because it's very smooth. He did use it. Okay. But he bone rubbed it, sanded it down okay. to keep the surface smooth. So, ah, so the difference between like Ty Cobb's bat and Joe DiMaggio's bat is that Joe DiMaggio actually rubbed the surface down to smooth it. Right. But we're going to talk about why these bats are worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. 
but the characteristics are different because the player is different. Here's Hack Wilson's bat. His signature right here is kind of blurred. He's got all these nails in it, carpet nails, okay? And what is the purpose of that? To hold from checking. Checking means that the wood grain is splitting. Mm -hmm. And so you got to understand they didn't have FedEx and could send it in to, you know, these guys are making, what, $3,500 a year? And they had a farm in Pennsylvania in the winter or sell clothes like Gil Hodges in Brooklyn in the summer. So they would put carpet nails in to, to stabilize the wood grain. Let's get to the last bat. And then we'll talk about how to, how to grade them. So far, you're seeing all the different characteristics based upon the time period and what the player's ability is and the rarity. So here's Hank Greenberg's game used bat, used by Ch in signature of Ch Charles Geringer. But it's side written, Charles Geringer, uh, September 1st, 1934. What does that all mean? That means he sent this bat in of Hank Greenberg's, he used it and liked it. So when he sent it in, they vault marked it, which means that this vault mark is G16. Mantle uses an M110 a lot. There's a lot of S2 bats out there. That's Vern Stevens from the Red Sox. Everybody likes his bat. Well, so why are these markings of Vern Stevens from the Red Sox on bats used by other players? Well, S means the f Steven or Stevens. It's the la first letter of the last day. 16 means He's the 16th player with the last name beginning with an S that registered as a con contractual relationship with the Louisville Slugger people. So if you see Colfax block letter, he did not have a contract with Louisville Slugger. Hannes Wagner in 1905 was the first to have a contract with Louisville Slugger. You can see Ty Cobb, he had a contract with Louisville Slugger. So he's got his actual signature on right. there. So we're learning a little bit about yeah. how all that works. Now, the next thing is we have all these different characteristics. Now, how do you grade all this? That's the problem that I don't like grading because this Colfax bat's worth a lot of money. And we all expect him, Trevor Hoffman, Roy Holiday, uh, Mike Messina, all their, you know, bats are kind of t not a lot of play. However, how do we know they didn't hit in spring training and then didn't use the bat in the game? How do we know that he didn't take it home and practice in the winter? Uh, you know, so it's, you have to use common sense. Now, I have kept records of all the bats that I got from the barn. But I also believe that yeah, you, you're, you're probably pretty clear if you see some of these bats. Uh, I don't have a problem if we don't know all the answers. Uh, if it smells good, looks good, and tastes good, and you use common sense with clear and convincing evidence, I'm okay with saying it's a game used bat. But I, so now... Would I grade this Colfax bat a 10? Maybe, maybe somebody would grade it a four. The problem is, what difference does it make? Sandy Colfax is probably the greatest pitcher in modern era. It's his bat, he probably used it. And so all these bats have so many different characteristics like photographs. If it's got a crease, is it a two? If it's got a corner chip, is it a four? You know, I mean, you can't grade. You can't grade what you can't grade. The only thing you can really grade are cards. And that's the problematic as it is when you have 150 people doing the same thing with a different opinion. So how do you solve the problem? By the characteristics. And so I have I like the idea use on this particular bat, which is Carlton Fist, light, ball marks, light, uh, uh, it goes on on a dead wood, blah, blah, blah. And let, leave it to the collector to decide whether it's worth it.
Now, we're dealing with a, a modern era of vent bats. That's a different story. Uh, I have a Kano bat that he had a home run. It's cracked. Uh, and it, gets, it got a nine. But it's real busted up. But it's an event bat. Just so I don't get too sidetracked. Be careful with event bats. I just happen to get have that. It's not some, one of my favorites because he's got some issues with steroids and he may not make it. And I don't think his attitude is too great. So, um, but um, I, I, I think that what you should do as a collector is the, all these grading services do have attributes like Walmart's blah, blah, blah. When you deal with the early players, Harry Hillman, Ty Cobb, uh, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, and so on, you know, uh, Dave Bancroft, High Pockets Kelly, the list goes on. Uh, you have to understand Joe DiMaggio. These bats are worth a lot because the demand is different than the supply. So this, if you look at the array of bats I've talked about, how do you grade them to make any sense? I mean, if you grade this bat, Sandy Kovac, so four, and there's only three in the world, you'd be crazy to not to buy it. What do you care if it's a four? It's not a four. It makes no sense. So I just think that the authenticators leave it to the collector to decide whether they want a bat. So if I see a Sandy Kovac bat that's real, and it's it doesn't have a lot on it, and it's signed, and it's his, he probably used it and couldn't hit a soccer ball. I'm going to buy it because it's worth a lot of money and it's the greatest pitcher in modern era. So, oh, does it have tape on it? And do you think every player that put tape on his bat always put tape on his bat? He didn't have time always to put tape on his bat. So, you know, leave it up to the collector to decide. Um, uh, this is different than event bats. You got to be careful with event bats. Like if you're a Del Murphy guy, mm -hmm. and you know, or Jose Posada, you know, these are marginal potential Hall of Famers. Probably better than some of the people they're taking in. Um, and you know, Del Murphy hit a grand slam with the bat, or some player that you can't even pronounce his last name today. You can't even read their writing, and you get all excited because he's a rookie and hit a home run, and you're paying ten thousand dollars. And two years later, he's hurt. You know, don't get caught up in in this stuff. You know, some of these people that are great now, like uh, you know, a guy like Mike Trout. He's he's you got to have ten years minimum play. Five, five of those five years in a player's career has got to be high end, you know, kind of Hall of Fame numbers. Those are, you know, I mean, Mike Trout's almost there, and he's a he's good at what he does, and he's clean. Uh, so you've got to control your emotions. Oh gosh, Joe Bagadonis hit a grand slam, and he plays for my favorite team, and I'm going to bust everybody's head to get that bat. Probably more. There's so many of them out there today. So, what I'm saying is, every bat that I've shown you today is, in my opinion, really special. And the attributes on them are so dif different that what, if you as a collector learn from today and continue to grow in understanding it, don't get caught up in the grade. Those of you that like the grade, that's fine. But if you see a Ty Cobb bat that's a five and there's like 20 in the world and you want it, it's still a Ty Cobb game used bat. And, and, and eventually, it's the value of it will continue to increase. So uh, some disagree with me, but that's how I collect. Now, to, to get into the weeds, if I may, I'm going to roll these bats towards you so I can do the Dimaggio bat. Okay. So <clears throat> we talked about the first little book that Dan Noel, Dave Bushing, and I put together to, to begin to authenticate bats. And as we talked earlier on, authentication 
does give credibility to to as much as possible to giving confidence in buying. But that doesn't give you the excuse not to use your own common sense in the clear and convincing evidence test. So in conclusion, let's break the Rosetta Stone. So we're going to look at the Joe DiMaggio bat. What we're going to look at is the center brand, the lightning bolts, the powerized, the signature, and the characteristics of the bat. Now, you see this, the knob, this is called a Hornsby knob. The, the bigger knobs, like on the Colfax, are called roof knobs. Okay. And then the Clementi doesn't have a knob. And when we talk later on about Clementi, he used the flare. And I think it's because his release didn't, wasn't interfered with the knob. But uh, that's my point of view. So let's take the book that was written by Vince Malta. And every bad authenticator calls this the Holy Bible. And most of the letters refer to using this book to uh, make letters of uh, LOAs. So let's open the book to the introduction and see what it says in one paragraph. This is from Vince Malta. Marshall Fogel, that's me, can you believe that? Is for allowing me to document his incredible collection of Hall of Fame player bats, which was instrumental in providing the most comprehensive study of H&B bat brandings to date. Virtually every picture in the player chart section is from Marshall's private collection of Hall of Fame player bats. Marshall has always been and continues to be a tremendous resource for information and inspiration. So I'm not reading that to be an egomaniac. I'm reading it because I want people to know two things. One, that what I say should have some power to it. And two, all, most all the bats in here have been authenticated by Vince Malta, independent of my view. And three, most of the pictures of the bats belong to me. Okay, so let's go first to the, the different pictures of powerized versions. Okay, so we're going to look at um, the... Um, the powerized, and what we look at powerized is, see the, the lightning bolts? Yep. Over different years, these lightning bolts have changed based yeah. on periods of time. And the P in powerized, sometimes it looks different. Yeah. So by going to the book, we'll call it, I can see all the different pictures of the lightning bolts in powerized. And it, Number 10 is power eyes. Everything fits the date period from 1937 to 1940. Okay. Bingo. That's when he played. Yeah. Okay. So that's part number one. Yeah. Um, so then the next is. So what you're really doing here is checking to ensure that it even makes sense that it could be a game used bat from the standpoint of looking at the different details of the bat, comparing it to what the book says to ensure that it's from the right year or era of that player's playing career. Correct. It's like when we talked about the photographs, we could tell from the photographs when it was made. So what we're doing is we're translating the same kind of information only to baseball bats. So, and then gloves, remember we dated the gloves. So it gives confidence when you have the factual information to make a decision. Otherwise, if we didn't have all these books and on um, photographs and books on gloves and, and, and ways in which to do anything, it becomes a guess. And we're not gonna do that. Uh, 
So the next is trademark reg. This trademark reg to save time in the book really illustrates the time period in the same period I just mentioned, 37 to 40. So if you look at the G in reg, it's shaped in a, uh, in a fashion that's unlike any other G in an earlier time period. It has more of an of a angle to it. So we look at Made in USA. We know that's 1920. So we're above, beyond 1913. Hillwork and Bradsby. Well, we know Bradsby became a partner in 1914, so we're not there yet. But we are, so all the center branding is prior to when Joe DiMaggio played. So moving on, uh, to, to keep things going, uh, the, um, the issue being, we know that he had a contract with Louisville Slugger, which is true. And trademark, the way it's written, is also in this time period of 37 to 40. So why don't we look at the records? These, this is what the records look like. That we're not allowed to have, but later on, Louisville Slugger was gracious enough to understand how important it would be and uh, to, to, to let us see the records. So if we, we know that I, I measured the bat and weighed it, and it, and it looks like uh, from the information that we have, this time period from, was in around 1937, a year after he, uh, it's either 37 or 38. Wow, that's, he's 36, he's a rookie. So this is just a brief way in which you understand about bats and why I think that the collector's knowledge is important in looking at all the attributes and making a decision for himself as to whether that's the bat he wants to buy. So uh, you want to own a Ruth bat? Uh, I have to say not all cars are the same, not all Ruth bats are the same, not all Lou Brock bats are the same, but on the whole, the way I look at it is when you take players like Carlton Fish, Steve Carlton, Don Sutton, um, is, you know, uh, Joe Morgan, you get the idea. There are plenty of those bats out there. Maybe not so much Sutton, uh, who's really underrated. My God, he played 23 years and he's got three, over a lot of, hit 300 wins or more. So let's say Lou Brock, there's a bat for $10,000. But there's also a Lou Brock good bat for 2500 You don't need to be spending $10,000. There's probably 50 that no one Lou Brock backs out there, and he's never going to be a first-tier Hall of Famer. So don't get caught up. Oh, i got to have it because it has tape on it. Well, Lou Brock didn't tape every bat in a certain way. So when it comes to the big boys, uh, you know, you, you, I would be uh, more discerning because the value of, of a Hank Greenberg bat or a Colfax bat. So sometimes if you get a Colfax bat and you can afford it and there's only three or four known and you can buy it, what do you care if it's a five? I mean, you're not going to find cleat marks on kind of Colfax's bat and all this stuff. But it's... That, it's it's worth more than some of these other bats because he, it's who he is. And you don't expect to find the same thing on a pitcher's bat. So I think overall I've given you an understanding like I have with everything. Baseball cards that are graded five can be beautiful. Uh, it's uh, same, same thing with all of it. Collector discretion is important. And... As far as the auction houses are concerned, they have a responsibility to sell you something that's real. But you have a responsibility of making the decision. And they can't guarantee everything because everybody has a different opinion. 
So buy what you can afford, but make sure that you feel it's true based upon the knowledge that you've gained from me and what you'll gain outside of what I've said. Uh, I think uh, next time we talk, we, we get into with uniforms and that'll be another interesting subject. But I hope, Jeff, this has helped the people that love to watch uh, your, your uh, YouTube and podcast. And in my opinion, um, I think I have a world-class collection. Sure. Uh, I don't think there's anybody that collects that doesn't think they have the best collection. But I happen to think I'm, I'm, per I'm probably up there. Yeah, a hundred percent, absolutely. Well, thank and you for the compliment. Yeah, and the range of the collection is absolutely incredible. And I know we're going to see a variety of different types of pieces today from your collection. But you've got everything from, you know, type one photographs to gloves to bats to, of course, unbelievable array of cards, including that iconic. The best Mickey Mantle 1952 Topps card in existence. I'm proud of what I have, and I like sharing it with the community. I've done a lot of things with museums and the community to enjoy it. And I'm, I'm going to enjoy this interview because I think what we're trying to do today in talking to you off the camera is let's educate the people that enjoy this not only collectible asset business, but as a hobby, just to have a yeah. good time with it and enjoy collecting uh, their memories of the people they watch play ball and the people that they are icons in the in the sports world that are no longer with us. So uh, let's get the game on and have a hell of a good time. I like it. Well, before we start seeing some of the pieces, I'd love to hear the story again about how you got into this to begin with, because you, you, you kind of encountered this without really knowing a lot about sports memorabilia uh, back in 1990. Is that correct? 1989. 1989. I went to Chicago uh, on a vacation with my family, and uh, I understood there was a sports national convention. I think it was like at a Holiday Inn in the basement. And as a kid, you know, I always liked Mickey Mann when I had his bat. And I think like a lot of us, um, it helps to share our memories by, by collecting. And I went downstairs. And I looked at all this stuff. And at that time, I didn't know that Ty Cobb was a ball player. I thought he might be a dress designer. You know, I was learning <laughs> the business. And, you know, as a kid, I was a second string on any athletic event. So, uh, but I loved the sports industry and loved playing baseball. And I used to wrestle in school. So I, I was sort of a sports addict in a way. And when I went downstairs from the escalator, I had heard about Al Rosen and Bill Master, mm -hmm. and I was intimidated. I have to tell you, the first card I ever bought was a 1953 Mickey Mantle card, and it turned out it was trimmed. So mm -hmm. I didn't get off to a great start, but I didn't give up as well. So it's kind of interesting because people now know who Al Rosen is because of the Mantle card being sold, and Bill Mastro, who really brought this from a hobby to, to uh, not only a hobby, but a collectible asset. And how that happened was, I remember walking downstairs and there was Bill Mastro, you know, and he was kind of a verbose type of guy and Al Rosen, you know, she's a shouter. So I was gonna go up and introduce myself to Bill Mastro. And I see that a little 12 year old kid had put his fingerprints on the case. And Bill said, get your hands off the case. I don't want anything to do. You don't have any money. Get out of here. So I, I had nothing to do with those guys. You know, I was scared to death because I didn't know what I was doing. But I knew enough that I loved what I saw. And that launched me starting to collect before I had met David Hall and became the poster boy for PSA around 1995. Mm -hmm. So what did you buy at that first national? I bought the Mantle card, mm -hmm. and I bought some Bowmans, 51, 52 Bowmans, and, uh, and I didn't buy any memorabilia at that time because I didn't understand it. And so I probably spent, you know, back then, maybe $20,000, $25,000. Those days, it was above average expenditure, sure. and I was buying cards for 
$15, $25, $50. You could buy a Colfax rookie for, uh, if I remember, $125, a Babe Ruth bat, $1,200. So that gives you an example yeah, of have the changed. genesis of the be being at the beginning. It's sort of like I felt like I was Moses coming down from Mount Sinai, uh, you know, and starting a whole new religion, and that's collecting. For well, me. You know, and what's interesting is, so 1989, that was the peak of the junk wax era. So that was when most people that year, I'm sure, went to the National. I would imagine most people were focused on the new Fleer baseball or the new, you know, upper deck baseball came out for the first time in 1989. I imagine that was, you know, a lot of the attention and focus. But you shied away from the new stuff. You turned around and paid attention to all of this older stuff, which I imagine, you know, there were a lot of people there focused just on the newer stuff. I think the answer to your uh, question is, did I even know about Upper Deck and mm -hmm. some of the new 1989 Bowmans and so on? I didn't see much of that there because I think they were at, uh, starting to market the product and so it wasn't uh, highlighted okay. the national at that time. Now, in 91 in Anaheim, we'll talk about that. Yeah, 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 Cause, because it, yeah, and at 91 in Anaheim, that was the, what is still considered to be the most attended national in history. Uh, some people thought that the last couple, you know, might have a chance of breaking the record, but they, they fell slightly short. 91 Anaheim, still the all-time attendance record. Uh, I hear that that, was, that one was just kind of mass hysteria, and I guess maybe marked the point when sports cards had hit their absolute kind of craziest peak moment. Let's put it this way. I thought it was the best sporting event I've ever been w with other people, and then they had special cards for the event. Well, that was the first time we ever saw, as we now know today, these limited edition cards. Mm -hmm. I don't remember who the players were, but I know guys were getting them for free and then going outside and selling them for three, four hundred dollars for the packs or whatever they were contained in cellos or whatever. But uh, what that meant to me was uh, I'm onto something. This is pretty exciting. Yeah. I'm not the only skin in the game. Yeah. I'd say there's some similarities probably between what that experience was like in 1991 at Anaheim and what we maybe have seen at the last couple of nationals where there's a lot of, you know, a lot of hysteria now, especially there especially was last year around, you know, modern cards, brand new releases, um, you know, people, people, people say that the, the price of new boxes today is crazy and everything like that. But many people coming into the sports card industry, many people coming into the hobby for the first time are they orient towards the new, you know, they orient towards the ultra modern. And then they, then they maybe discover some of the vintage over time. And that was my experience as well when I got back into it in 2018 was I oriented towards the brand new shiny stuff. And then as I continued through, I, I started to pay attention to the older stuff and started to scoop a lot of it up as well. You though went straight for the older stuff and, and I, I, you don't have, I don't think you have an affinity for kind of the new stuff that's coming out today. Well, I have a, some of it, a detailed, interesting response to your uh, narrative, and that is that um, what is it in starting our conversation and our visit, what is it about baseball that's so attractive? What is it about the golden era of baseball that remains in perpetuity? And I think the answer is as follows. You have basketball, hockey, football, baseball, tennis, golf, and so on. The real sport of the singular hero is baseball. To score a basket in basketball, you need a whole team to pass and score the points. Football, you need 11 players on offense to do their job to score a touchdown. But to hit a home run and call the shot in 1932, or to play in 56 consecutive games where you get a hit, or you hit 714 home runs in your career, or 60 home runs in a season, nobody forgets that. People, why is Joe Jackson's signature the most expensive signature in American sports? So 
Questions have answers. One of the answers is, what is it about baseball beyond the singular hero? How many times can you be so good that when a pitcher is 60 feet, six inches away from the plate, and after the stretch, he's 56 feet away and throws the ball in 0.02 seconds and a guy's holding a stick. The best way I can define the sport of baseball and why it still remains the king in collecting and always will, especially the vintage stuff, the cards, is because if you watch The Field of Dreams mm -hmm. with Kevin Costner. Yep. One of my, I, my favorite movie of all time, by the way. It's mine as well. Yeah. Or The Natural with Robert yep. Redford. Yep. I'm going to ask you, Jeff. What happened the last 20 seconds of each of those movies? You tell me. And if you don't know the answer, don't be embarrassed. No, no. Well, that, I mean, in the Field of Dreams, uh, there was the catch. There was the father-son connection. There was the father-son moment. Same with the natural. Mm -hmm. In the Field of Dreams, he never had a chance to play the catch with his right. dad. In the natural, he didn't know he had a son. Mm -hmm. So if you go to that movie, if you ever d did... I've never seen so many men have a tear in their yeah, eye. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it chokes people up. Yeah, yeah, I went to Field of Dreams with my dad. I remember watching it when, you know, with my, we went to the theaters when it was out in the theaters and I went with my dad and I remember it being a very special moment. I actually visited the field out in Iowa uh, for that reason, you know, did, did a pilgrimage to go see it. My father and mother, you know, my father was a, from Eastern Europe and he didn't know about baseball. And I used to beg him to play catch. So one day he decided to play catch. He throws the ball to me, and I, I'm 11 years old, and I threw the ball back to him, and I broke his thumb. <laughs> so I do remember that yeah. moment, but I also remember, his, and I'm even as old as I am, I still see it in my mind my father and I playing catch. Mm. So people say, what is it about baseball? It's the movies, it's your father playing yeah. catch. It's that simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. Mm -hmm. Do you have any concern that with the demographics of the country shifting, with, it, with the attention span of the you know, young generations becoming shorter, uh, you see the, the numbers in terms of what sports people are watching. And you see, uh, you know, over the last 20 years, you've seen football rise. You've seen recently soccer have an incredible surge in, you know, surge in popularity in the country. Um, you know, basketballs remain popular, but you've seen, you've seen baseball fall. Uh, as, you know, you've seen ratings for baseball fall. There's not as many fans today. They're having a more difficult time getting the younger generation into the game. And I'm curious, as a collector of so much of baseball history, do you think that in the long term could have an impact over, uh, you know, over what people are, are you know, collecting or wanting to collect and, and pay attention to? I think there's some complexity to your question. Um, and I think what you're asking me is, is the game of baseball such that because the attendance is not as rampant as other sports. Uh, it's a slower game. Um, it's, uh, is it going to affect the vintage card market? Maybe it's more in line with what you're trying to find out from me. Um, I'm not concerned about it at all. I think what's happening, sports in general, is becoming an international sport whether it's baseball, football in London, uh, soccer's becoming much more attentive in here. Uh, hockey, of course, Colorado Avalanche won the hockey uh, Stanley Cup. Uh, all that's great. But nobody remembers Lenny Dawson, Daryl LaMonica, Jim Otto, uh, they don't, Bob Cousy, yeah. Havlicek, Bob Pettit, but they remember Ruth, Cobb, Wagner, Garrett, DiMaggio, Colfax, Greenberg, uh, the Cobb, as sure. I said. Mays, Mantle. I mean, the list goes yeah, on. Hank Aaron. Why is that? Why do we remember people that have been gone for over 50 to 100 years? 
in, in many cases, I mean, I never saw any of those guys play, but of course I know their names, they're legendary, and I know stories, you know, the stories are legendary, right? I think it's because, first of all, baseball has statistics that no other sport has. It's true. There's a whole generation of people that love just the statistics of the sport. Uh, I just don't think that we're going to see the popularity of any sport really go down uh, because it's the special golden part of baseball. The way I see it now is I remember watching movies where Joe DiMaggio said, thank God I'm a Yankee. Or Mickey Mantle, when, you, when I spoke to him, when we had uh, drinks together in Atlantic City, he said, if I would have been traded, because they were thinking of trading um, him at one time, probably not thinking too long about it, he would have quit. And I, I just feel that the singular hero will survive. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing about it is, um, you don't have the same type of player today. These guys played in the golden era for the love of the sport. Mm -hmm. Now I think whether it's football, soccer, hockey, it's all about money. Mm -hmm. And you know, I have had Larry Walker uh, spent time with him, and he never wanted to leave Denver because he wanted to stay the same team like Todd Helton and uh, a lot of. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people that play for mid-market teams, they become a hero because they're so good. Yeah. And the minute they go after the money, they get forgotten. And baseball is woven into American history much more than any other sport. And the reason why is, if you, re if you look back in history, uh, we're a land of immigrants. So... Uh, the Polish lived in their neighborhood, the Jews lived in their neighborhood, the Irish, the Italians, the Catholics, the Protestants, and we lived in our safe communities. Then they played baseball. So everybody from every nationality, race, creed, color, national origin would go and root for the team. And from there, they got to know each other. And business relationships got started. And people started to evolve, evolve into the neighborhoods that were integrated in the culture. So baseball has played a, a big part in our culture in, in, in integrating uh, the great American dream uh, where, you know, over time we've learned uh, that all men are created equal. And I think baseball had a lot to do with it. And I think that's why they call it the national game. And when was the first time the national election was ever played at a sporting event? Baseball. Interesting. I didn't know that. So your collection is predominantly baseball, but you do actually have some other sports represented as well. Yes, I have some hockey. I have Bobby Orr's hockey stick where he won uh, Defenseman of the Year in 1972, Mario Lemieux, Gordie Howe, and so on. I, uh, my dad and I love boxing. We used to watch Gillette Sports Boxing. Ezra Charles, Jersey Joe Walcott, uh, Rocky Marciano, uh, uh, you know, the list goes on. And when I was a kid, as you can see by looking at me, I'm not very heavy and I'm not very tall. So my dad hired a professional boxer and taught me how to take care of myself. So that, with my hands and carrying a baseball bat in my bicycle, I was able to handle the barrio. So I do like, I love boxing, I love hockey, but my real true enjoyment is uh, the history of baseball yeah. and the, uh, the fact that I can hold in my hand the cards, photos, bats, and so on that were held by my heroes. You, since you started collecting back in 1989. Correct. You've amassed an absolutely incredible collection. And I had the honor of getting to see a lot of it today and we're gonna show the audience some of it now. And you, uh, of all different types of, of collectibles, mainly baseball, but within that, all different types. How, uh, and, I, and I'm sure you've learned so much along the way and I can't wait to hear some of those stories because I know they're gonna to translate to what our, our audience wants to hear. Um, 
how much do you think your collection is worth today? Well, that's a self-serving answer, but I, I don't think it's a question of value of money. I think it's a question of value of the quality and of, of what I collect. Uh, my view is that uh, it's only by circumstance that it become valuable. I, I collected it because I loved it, uh, but I didn't control what is happening today in the marketplace by the popularity of, of collecting. I think it's wise to know how that happened. Why did it, a hobby turn into a collectible asset and remain a hobby? So if you have $500 or $50, you're just as important as the guy spending two million dollars. And in my view, uh, if this was only like in the world of art, if all the, they had Monet, Monet, Utrillo, Rembrandt, Rubens, uh, that market is for the whales, the, the, the guys with a lot of money and, and gals with a lot of money. What makes this a, a hobby and a collectible asset industry is because of the interest in the game, the singular hero, the sport, the people love when, you know, uh, when their team wins. Winning is a big deal in American life. And uh, so uh, the way I look at it is uh, what keeps this alive is not the most expensive collections, but the fact that there's so much for everybody to have skin in the game. So, uh, yes, I have a monetarily valuable collection, but, and I'm overwhelmed by the values, what the stuff is selling for, but my motivation has always been the emotional attachment to the sport, the enjoyment of collecting, the people I meet like Jeff Wilson and the crew that's here today, uh, and sharing it with the community. I think today, what in light of what your narrative has been with me, is to have fun explaining and educating uh, the people that enjoy uh, uh, collecting sports. Yeah, which just really gives the opportunity to do. I yeah. welcome that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, I love your thought as well. It's an interesting comparison that you just made to the art world, because. You're right that if you're going to collect the, the greats in the art world, that is very much a rich man or rich woman's game. And there's not as much ability to collect art if you only have $100 or $500 that you're going to put into it. But cards and memorabilia offers you the ability to play the rich man's game and, and buy exceptional pieces that could be worth millions of dollars or... You can go to the local card show and you can take $100 with you and you can pick up some really nice, interesting cards that connect you with the players you love and the teams you love and build a collection, even if the collection is on the, you know, on the very low end financially. Well, my, my, uh, I come from a, a sort of middle class family. My father's from Eastern Europe. My mother's first generation American from... Uh, uh, Romania and uh, you know uh, my dad had a pawn shop and uh, I had a very close family uh, I uh, played you know baseball and wrestled and you know did what kids do and and uh, you know I lived in the 50s life was simple the rules were clear you, you got on a bus and a nun got on the bus you stood up if a woman it was with you, you opened the door for her. So, you know, it was it was simple and wonderful. We watched programs, All in the Family, Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best, Gunsmoke. Uh, you know, uh, it was just a lot of fun. And uh, so I, I went to uh, uh, school. Uh, I was a, not a good student at all. And uh, uh, I barely got out of college. I barely got out of law school. But I, just to be short, I gave a lecture. We had to give a lecture in, in labor law and law school. I went to Denver University with a lot of older men, because there weren't a lot of women in the law then, that uh, were on the GI Bill. 
So after I never, I have a pretty, fairly good photographic memory, and I never use notes. I can try a case on a post-it. So I gave this lecture with no notes, and the dean of the law school taught the class, and he said, Mr. Fogel, everybody leave but you. And they all thought I was going to get kicked out of school because my grade average was below freezing. So um, he said, and this will be summarize everything, he said, you are the worst student in the school, you know that? I said, yes, sir. And uh, you're one of the youngest in the school, I know that, but you're a lousy student. Yes, sir. I sa he said, you'll never be a judge. You'll never be a corporate lawyer, but you got a mouth on you. You'll be one hell of a trial lawyer. Go find your way, and I'll never forget it. And so, because of some political influence that my family had, I got, I'm, I was 24 years old, I got in the DA's office in Denver, and I'm still the youngest they ever hired. By the time I was 27, I handled over 30 murder cases, tried the mafia, I've seen it all. I uh, started my own firm, Vogel, Keating, and Wagner, and uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm a little guy, but in a courtroom, watch out. And, uh, but now I'm a nice guy uh, because I, I'm with you, Jeff Wilson, and I like talking about my humility, which I learned recently. I've always been a person who has always wanted everything neat and tidy and simple. And, and, and even when I had toys, I always took care of them in comic books, you know. For some reason, I had the instinct to want to uh, uh, have everything in order. Uh, and I think that's important, is to have structure in, in collecting and, and to be a person of great detail and, and to uh, uh, be orderly and think a lot about what you're doing. So the background of my collecting is, A, educate yourself. B, rely on yourself. Read about it. Learn about it. Enjoy it. Don't depend on the auction houses for, for anything. Get a mentor that's a collector. Collect horizontally, don't collect vertically. And what I mean by that is if you collect Brooklyn Dodgers, there's a point where if you keep drilling down, you're gonna get a bunch of stuff nobody cares about. You wanna collect the, you wanna figure out who do I wanna collect to? I wanna collect Colfax, Greenberg, Matheson, uh, you know, whatever. What, what subjects do you wanna collect? I decided to collect horizontally. I wanted to collect the history. Uh, and I also wanted to collect the condition is everything. I don't really care if Babe Ruth signed a photo of him with a called shot and it looks like a fifth wheeler truck ran over it. I'm not buying that. Now, that doesn't mean somebody else couldn't buy it because they can afford it. But I think condition is everything. Also, look, look at what, what are you buying? What's the story behind what you're buying? And so that's generally the way I look at it. Uh, I think the main thing I can tell the viewers of, this, uh, of what we're doing here today, you don't, you're the sheriff. You're, you're responsible for your mistakes and you're responsible for the assets that you accumulate. Learn what you're doing. Learn, and we're going to talk about LOAs and all that later on, but um, I've had people that have money that want my advice, and I give it to them, and then they go off on their own, and they don't call back, and they make a lot of mistakes, and they spend a lot of money, and they then they lose money on it. Uh, and I, so I think you, you have to understand there is, in every time there's money, there's fraud. And that doesn't mean that it's rampant, but it's there. And so that's why education is important. And we get talking about uniforms and bats and everything. We'll get into that in the weeds a little more. Photographs. When I look at a photograph, I see an image, but I want to know the story behind it. So I collect photographs, advertising pieces. When you see Stan Musial smoking a Chesterfield cigarette and Gil Hodges saying it's, uh, these cigarettes are mild, you know, it's part of history. Uh, I like the color of the advertising pieces. I like, you know, to get one that's not re overly, not restored. And, and you know, and also uh, the beauty of the color of it. Uh, I collect uh, uh, pinbacks. 
celluloid, metal pins, uh, everything. Let's see, I collect baseball gloves, uh, magazines that don't have labels on them. Uh, I collect uh, uh, baseball gloves, baseball, signed baseballs, autographed photos. Um, I collect, uh, uh, like I have Joe DiMaggio's handprints in, in, in uh, clay. You know, it's kind of fun when people put their hands in it. Um, I collect optics. I like to have people see, God, that's beautiful. It's not so much the image, you know. I don't care to collect a card that looks like a truck ran over signed by Babe Ruth because it's, the optics aren't there. There is something beautiful about something beautiful. One of the things you collect is cards. Yes. And uh, outsiders have said that you have the most important baseball card in the world and of those cards, the best conditioned version of that card, the most valuable version of that card. The 1952 Tops Mickey Mantle, you have one of three PSA 10 cards and yours earned the Black Diamond sticker from Mike Baker who actually graded all of those and he attested that yours is the nicest copy ever to exist. Well, we decided, he, he thought, well, should we call it the Mona Lisa or the Holy Grail? The Mona Lisa doesn't have a religious connotation, so we thought the Holy Grail, you know, had sort of the, the Templar look to it, you know? I mean, it, it, uh, it, it, it has a magical name. Um, do you want to know how I got the card? I would love to hear the story. <laughs> okay. It did not come from the Rosenfine. The Rosenfine, uh, uh, most of those cards have sort of a brown coloring on the top, mm -hmm. and the centering isn't there. This card, believe it or not, came out of a pack. And a guy that owned it was an architect named Murphy, and I've forgotten his first name, but his son is a dealer. And Murphy was, a, I haven't talked to him in years, but he was a, he's a wonderful man and a very respectful guy, good, great architect. And so uh, what happened was um, Murphy had the 52 top set. This is before grading. And he decided to sell it in Wolfer's auction in San Francisco. Dwayne Garrett ran that auction. It used to be a coin auction, and then he got it into cars as well. And so the minute, the, the, if you could pay $250,000, you'd have the set. And it was a monster. I mean, the, you know, back then you could find beautiful cars. Not as easy today. Didn't sell. The set didn't sell. Mm. So David Hall ended up buying Parts some of those cards, and he paid 50 grand for the mantle card. Well, in 1996, there was a whole contest who was going to sell his collection because David had to sell his collection because you can't collect and grade at the same time. And that's another story today as well. But so he sold his collection, and the mantle card was there. And uh, Superior Auctions got the, the deal to sell David Hall's collection. I had to have that card, knowing I didn't know if there was 20 other 10s out there or whatever it is. I just had to have the, that 10. And uh, so luckily it turned out to be the Holy Grail. That was sheer luck. So I'm at the auction at my home. There's a grocer from New York, never bought a card in his life, but had seen the mantle card on display. Never, I still stay in touch with him. It was him and me, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000, and then I think some people dropped out. Now it's me and the grocer from New York. And I'm on the phone, there's no internet. David Hall's on the phone, calls me, 75,000, make it 80. And he got the other guy on the other phone, it's going like this. He said 80, 85, 90, 100. Well, now we're, it's 121,000 and I'm done. So I say 121,000, and David Hall, 121,000, and it's silence. I said, David, hammer the thing. You know, of course, he's not going to hammer it. It's, you know, it's about money. Hammer it. The guy never hears another word. He bang, he hammers it. I get it for 121,000. And, and so David, 
I, I didn't have cash of 121000 in 1996. David said, you'll get credit because he already, I'm already his poster boy by then, you know. And, and it looked good that Marshall Fogel bought the card. And so um, that's how I got the card. And I got highly criticized in the SCD for buying the card. They thought I was a fool. And then I told you now I'm wise. No one had ever paid anywhere close to that no. for, for a post-war no. baseball card at the time. Uh, let me put it this way. I was considered the dumbest human being on the face of the earth. No question about it. And as the hobby grew and collectible assets grew and all the others came out and you know mine got the black label, um, I'm really so lucky not only to own that card but some other really crazy stuff that's pretty cool. You paid $121,000 for the card. Today, people say Maybe it's worth $35 million. Maybe it's worth more than $35 million. Do you have a feeling what the value is? Well, it's what anybody will pay for it, but I can tell you this. Uh, um, until you see the money, I, I, I do think it's, it's up there. Uh, this is my speculation. Uh, I think the interest level in owning that card because of so many oligarchs now buying this stuff uh, I don't have any question that it's the most valued card in the world. And the son of a pawnbroker owns it, who used to work construction and had the lowest grade average in law school. You don't have to be smart to be eccentric, and you don't have to be smart to, to have instinct. You just have, you know what it is, Jeff? Success in life and collecting and anything you do is knowing the street, getting along with people, having humility. God takes care of those that take care of others. And if you live your life that way, you'll be successful in anything you do and work your butt off. Would you sell the mantle card for any offer today? Well, the answer to that is I bought 20 acres in a cemetery and I'm building a pyramid and I'm going to lay the mantle card on my chest when they bury me and you can all wish you could figure out how to dig my body up. No, I... I uh, I don't have an answer for that. I don't care about the money right now. Uh, I enjoy sharing what I have. Um, you know, would I ever sell it? Uh, I'd consider offers, but I'm right now, in my stage in life, uh, you know, it's, it's nothing I'm really thinking hard about because uh, it's not a matter of money with me. It's a matter of owning something that everybody wants to see. I have an ability to share what I have. And if I sell the card, I don't want it not to, I don't know if, if people will have a chance to enjoy it. You know, I displayed it at the All-Star Game in yeah. Denver. So I like, I like people enjoying what I have. A lot of collectors, they, they want to keep it a secret. What, what, what for? You can't keep a secret today anyway. Yeah. Tell me about displaying it at the All-Star Game, because that was quite the spectacle. Well, part of my business is I'm, I, I'm a certified law enforcement instructor, and uh, I do a lot with law enforcement. I started the Denver Police Brotherhood. I'm on the Denver Police Officers Foundation. I really care about the, those people. Uh, I've represented them in problems that they've had, family all kinds of things. That's part of my practice. So uh, we were able to get motorcycle cavalcade of mm -hmm. cops uh, to take the card from the safety deposit box in a caravan to the stadium with all the press there and the sirens going off in an armored car. Uh, and it, the card deserved it. And uh, it, it is, and you see the card in person uh, and people love to see it. I, I can tell you, you can look at all the Mano 52s you want, and you look at that card, it's almost like you're looking at a secret. How could it be so beautiful? The color, the condition, the corners. Then it came from a pack. It didn't end up in a kid's bicycle spokes. It wasn't thrown against the wall. It wasn't thrown away by his mother, and it survived. Part of the value of it is... It's so old and never got hurt. Yeah. It's really very special. Yeah. And so is Mickey Mantle. I love the guy. I loved his career. I loved his story. 
I loved his image. Look at the, all the other 52 cards in that set. And look at the mantle card, like the 53. Why is it so special? It looks so different than all the other cards in the 407 cards in that set. Because sometimes, uh, sometimes the spirit of heaven shines its hands on special people and special things. And I think something, you know, the print, the color was right. They put the right ink in. All the things had to happen for that card to make it what it is. So sometimes if you're spiritual, some maybe there's another hand that played a game to make that card what it is, to put their hand on it. It's just so amazing. Hmm. That's wonderful. Wonderful. I'm sure you're unbelievably proud to own that. I'm proud to own it, and I'm proud to share it. Yeah. Well, what is it about Mickey Mantle for you? Why Mantle? The story. The story of his life. And the fact that a 19-year-old kid is replacing Babe Ruth and Joe DiMaggio in center field. And the pressure on a kid from Commerce City, Oklahoma, and uh, Stengel loved him. And when he got sent down, because uh, George Weiss wanted him sent down, Stengel hated that. Everybody knew, think, he played for Joplin, Missouri. How do you know a kid that young would be so great? I don't think there's a ball player in the modern era that can match Mantle. And when Gene Levy wrote her book on Mantle, uh, and we'll talk about that when we get into photographs, uh, she, she has statisticians compare Mays and Mantle. Mantle's fork exceeds Mays's abilities, and though Mays is one of the greatest ball players in the modern era. How do you be a switch hitter and be so powerful? How do you be have such so many injuries and be so great? How do you how do you do it? I mean, I, I just think he's one of the greatest athletes that ever lived. You got to meet Mickey Mantle before, yes. as you said. I met him in Atlantic City, uh, and you know it's interesting. There's two players in my lifetime that I met that have the aura of Elvis Presley and Clint Eastwood, and that's Sandy Colfax and Mickey Mantle. Mm. When you meet, if you ever have a chance or had a chance to meet Mantle or meet, meet Colfax today, you walk up to that table. If You know, the last time I saw Colfax, the line in Chicago went around the block. Mm -hmm. It's the most popular autograph ever. He's one of the most handsome, good-looking guys. And uh, Bear, once when I met Bear, he said, he said, Somebody told me they hit a home run off of Colfax and I called him a liar. All right, Marshall, so you have absolutely won me over with the scope of your card collection, but you've got a lot more than just cards, including Type 1 photos. Tell me, tell me about this Mickey Mantle Type 1 photo. What makes this one so special? Well, sometimes words don't describe what makes it special. Oh, look at that. That's incredible. So is that the original photo? For the cover of the, the, book, cover of the book, the biography of Mickey Mantle. Wow. What a good photo, too. Pardon? Such a good photo of Mantle. This is 1954. Okay. And floor. what makes the Type 1 photos special? For those out there, I know you're an expert on photos. For those out there who don't understand the significance of what a Type 1 photo is, talk to me about that. Well, 2005, Henry Yee and I wrote the book on photographs, and we invented the number type one de description, two, three, and four. And that is now used all over the world. Including by PSA, uh, when they're grading. Well, that was, uh, they, when Joe Orlando was with Collector's Universe, we visited with him, and he loved the idea of encapsulating photographs. And we decided not to grade photographs. Okay. Uh, it's impossible. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's just too many uh, factors to put into it. And, and so we did it by types. I do want to make it clear to the, to the people watching the program, don't get worried about you don't have a type one. Type two, three, and fours are really special. You have to remember, new service photos, black and white photography, ended uh, in the 60s. 
you know, we had glass plates, we made photographs out of albumin, and, you know, and daguerreotypes and so on were made. But you have to understand, those of you that see a beautiful image that's a type 2, 3, and 4, own it. It's less money. The story is there. The image is just as important. If it's missing a corner, or has a crease, or it's got some journalistic marks on it, don't worry about it. Why spend $10,000 when you can spend $250? Go for it. You have to understand this is not, this is still a hobby. It's not about money. It's not about winning. It's about enjoyment. I just happened to be there at the time of the Civil War and was there before <laughs> anybody ever discovered America. And so this... Listen, so you're I, able to buy all of this for I mean, I'm paying, a fraction of what it's worth today. I'm paying... $1,500 for a Clementi rookie and a nine. I'm paying $3 for commons. I mean, you know, so this is, I didn't have a lot of money. Uh, you know, I mean, I was better off than most, but I mean, when I bought uh, some of these cars, they were $2,500, $750. Gowdy, Gowdy, uh, Gowdy uh, uh, Hall of Famers were 700 bucks in, in eights and nines. So, this is, I remember uh, all these mantle cars were, I don't know, $300, 150 bucks. So we wrote this book, and Henry E. Uh, is really, does most of it for PSA. I quit doing a lot of the grading, though I do participate because I don't have the time. But what I'm trying to explain to, the, to your viewers is once you, we did this book, and once you do, we'll, we'll talk about it later, bat, book on bats. And I wrote this with two other guys, and the, the bat book's been updated. People have confidence in the product. So this, these books written by people like myself that have experience help make the market, mm -hmm. help the public understand what is valuable. I'm not talking about money now. I'm talking about the value of the experience of owning a Cobb or owning a photograph of, of uh, Babe Ruth or Greg Maddox or Mike Schmidt or D Derek Jeter or Willie Mays. So uh, that's the value. So if you want to hand me another photo, let's do some really fun ones. Why I recognize you... this photo. Okay, you talk about it. This photo is the photo from the other most iconic baseball card of all time. You've got the 52 mantle, obviously, the 52 tops mantle, considered one of the most iconic baseball cards of all time. And then, of course, the T206 Hannes Wagner is the other most iconic baseball card of all time. And this is the photo from it. I've never seen this before. I've never seen it before. I'll, you know, obviously, I've seen the card image a, a ton of times, but I've never seen the photo. Well, if you continue to be nice to me, you can come back and look at it again. <laughs> uh, so what I want to say about this, you see, let's talk about when the photo was made. So okay. turn it around okay. and look at the back and show the Coca-Cola ad. Okay. That Coca-Cola ad is 1904. Interesting. The card of Wagner yeah. is 1909. Right, 1909. So the image is five years earlier. Interesting. A lot of people don't so know it, that. So the photo was taken for this Coca-Cola ad? Or it was just used for, it was taken in general and used no, for that I, purpose I, and other purposes? I, you know, I think Carl Horner, uh -huh. and I, and who's uh, considered by uh, um, the most Smithsonian photographer, uh, her last name is Einstein, and she is related to Albert Einstein, was here, she's a top gallery photographer. She said, you can't even duplicate the quality of taking this photos. You know, they had those big cameras, mm -hmm. glass plates. So if you look at the photo, and this is what I'm trying to tell, look at the image of the photo. Yeah. Look at the story of the photo. Horner never signed the back of his photos. He only had, you have to have the mount to make it a type one. Where Bain, Conlon, Brace, Paul Thompson, all the great photographers that are recognized for the first time in this book, A Portrait of Baseball Photography, are now People want to collect the Thompson and the Conlon, but if you don't have the mount, and you got to be careful when you collect mounts because a lot of people will have a mount and then they'll put a fake Wagner on the mount. So that's why we, you and Jeff, you and I have mm -hmm. talked. Get, learn, get a mentor, 
Mm -hmm. Talk to people who know what they're doing because there's a lot of this stuff going on that are described as type ones and they're not. Yeah. So uh, let me, when we talk about photographs, yep. it's even more technical than the cards. Yeah. So um, and if I I think in, I wouldn't buy a type one unless there's a letter from Henry e or me or both right. of us because right. uh, it's too complicated. Interesting. Wow, that's wild. Talk to me about talk to me about this photo. Is this a type one? Yes. That's the Garrick 33 Gaudi type one. Oh my gosh, it is. It is. Look at that. Look at that. That's it. That's it. That's the Garrick. Unbelievable. That's really, really cool. And then how about this one? That's a real signature. Wow. Now this was used when Honest Wagner ran for sheriff and lost. Interesting. Yeah, they, that, that was on his, on his, I have a pin that looks like this, but this was the image he used when he ran for sheriff. You know, Walter Johnson ran for office, ran for Congress and lost as well. Huh. So, uh, Compliments of Honest Wagner, he signed it. It's, look at the beautiful signature. Yeah, it's a really nice signature. Now, if you that's, look at That's this, penmanship that you don't see uh, with modern day athletes today, they're not they're not taking the time to sign their you know modern cards with quite that much uh, penmanship. Exactly. So that's just an example of some of the wonderful quality of photographs that are out there. But there are images like this that you can spend a hundred bucks and have a, put it in your office, put it in your caveman, enjoy it. Don't worry about the money when you collect. Worry about what you enjoy. Yeah. And I can't emphasize that enough. I got lucky because it would, nobody cared when I collected this right. stuff. And I was able to collect before anybody cared about it. Marshall, this is absolutely incredible. The greatest collection I've ever seen. And I thank you so much for sharing it with us. This has just absolutely been amazing. All right, I hope you enjoyed this very special episode with Marshall Fogel. I want to remind you that the full length videos of The Jeff Wilson Show are on YouTube under The Jeff Wilson Show. It's its own channel. And then we also have the audio recordings on both Spotify and on Apple Podcasts. So make sure you go subscribe everywhere so you can catch these episodes of The Jeff Wilson Show when they come out every week. We appreciate you, and we'll see you next week for the next one. Take care.